As we move into this important, important, probably the most important part of this panel presentation, the, our, our discussion backward and forward with you in the audience, and I think uh, Al McQueen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have a good 25, 30 minutes to do that. I have tried to exercise good Monlanian Frilimo discipline with this panel and, and, and try to move us forward so we could have ample time. I would, I would beg the indulgence as a young whippersnapper kind if I could make a, a small little intervention myself. I had, as I mentioned, the great honor to work for Frilimo as a school teacher at the Mozambique Institute and have had the great fortune to have worked very closely with the Mozambique government ever since. And I want to just share with you an evening in 1968. It would have been around December or January. When I arrived in Dar es Salaam to come and join the staff at the Mozambique Institute. And Eduardo had already seen me briefly and asked me one evening to come out to the house in Bagamoyo to talk with him. And that night we talked about several things. One was planning for me to make a trip down to the liberated areas of Mozambique to look at the school needs of the primary schools in the liberated areas. He asked me at some length about my family in Chicago, who he had known in the 50s at the Warren Avenue Congregational Church. And then he came, we, we sat, and it was just the two of us, it was an extraordinary evening. And then he came to the real reason for his getting me out to the house very early on. And it was very related to the internal struggle within Frilimo at that point that was growing up, and many in the room can discuss this certainly equally, if not more in depth than what I can, but it has always had a certain deep impression in me, and I want to share it with you. He said to me, Prexy, I'm a bit worried about you. And I said, why? He said, I'm worried because I've heard some reports that in your political activism in the United States, you have been very involved in pushing a kind of black power line. Now, you should know that in about this same period of time, Stokely Carmichael was in and out of Dar es Salaam. And this was a very serious, serious subject matter to raise. And I think it wasn't too far after there had also been the discovery of, a, and I think one of the panelists mentioned, the problem of provocateurs and agents inf infiltrators. And there had been a man by the name of Leon Milas, I think was his name. Leo. Leo, Leo Milas, who I would later learn much more about. I think he still operates out of Kenya or somewhere. Who posed, if I'm not mis mistaken, there are many people who were, Janet, help me. I think he posed as a Mozambican, but Eduardo had found out that, in fact, he was really an Afro-American agent who had infiltrated from San Diego. Free Limo. Uh, yeah. With those things as background, then, Eduardo asked me this question about my political, ideological view and having heard this about uh, my advocating a position of black power. And we started discussing this. And he said to me, he said, Prexy, I know your family. I know your background. You were, you were here because I had confidence in who you were. He said, I'd be very shocked to have you have this kind of political perspective. And I explained to him things that had been happening when on the way to Mozambique as I refused to serve in the Vietnam War and had left the States. I uh, had gotten very involved with, for a period of time because of difficulties in Tanzania. I couldn't enter, Mozambique, uh, enter Tanzania to work with the Mozambique Institute right away. And I explained to him that I had been active with different forces in London, but that I did not have the position of, of a black power uh, advocacy, and that I had a clarity about the nature of who was the enemy. And I mentioned this 
only because I think, as Ambassador Skinner indicated already, and that Ed Hawley alluded to as well, that the question of defining the enemy and knowing who the enemy was in the struggle being waged and moving beyond race to have a position on that was a crucial, crucial role in making of liberation struggles the political struggles that they were. It's a tremendously important point, and I think is one that differentiated national liberation movements from uprisings and struggles that we have had in the United States, where weaponry became the key part of the struggle as opposed to a political vision about where we were going. And in 19, I just want to finish very quickly and read a small passage of a paper I presented some time ago reflecting on this. As an Afro-American long involved in the United States and Southern Africa, I'm reading from my paper presented to the MacArthur Foundation all over Southern Africa. I have always been impressed with how people suffering such pain and loss could yet have such a breadth in their vision. In Southern Africa, there's a clear clarity about the goal of struggle that I find missing in the United States. When the Nelson Mandela's, the Agostino Neto's, the Oliver Tombos, the Eduardo Monlani's, and the Amilcar Cabral's in Africa articulated that they were struggling for non-racialism and non-sexism, it formed part of a coherent, comprehensive, and well thought out vision that I often but not always, often but not always, found woefully absent in what is articulated here in the United States. I have, I have a, a sense of struggle in politics personally that I will forever be grateful, at least in part, to Eduardo for that wonderful dinner we had in uh, Oyster Bay there in Dar es Salaam. Thank you all very much. Let us entertain uh, some discussion and questions. And I would simply ask that in the interest of as much participation as possible that those of you asking questions and making additional comments try to keep them also disciplined and coherent and short. Please. Don't be shy, especially you Oberlin uh, undergraduates. We, this is a great, this, this moment you've had today, it's an extraordinary amount of history that has been shared this, this morning. Yes, please, if you'd stand up, sir, and real loud. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, um, I'm a student from uh, Mozambique. I'm attending Spalding University in Kentucky, Louisville. And uh, I'd like to thank this opportunity that was uh, created and given to us. There's about uh, 10 students from Mozambique attending this conference today. And uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a personal question. I would like to know, uh, if possible, if any one of you uh, has a better uh, explanation or understanding of the entire situation uh, about the assassination of Dr. Mondlane. It's, uh, it's a, um, I hear different stories from different people. Now, you have been, you having lived that time, might have better uh, understanding and maybe a, a little clarification on that. Thank you very much. Herb, Herb Ed, the both of you were in Dar es Salaam, as I, was I at that time, which of you want to go first? That's a very difficult question. I'm not sure there are any final answers even now, but uh, clippings from the time I have put out on the table in outside the entrance up there that you may want to look at. Um, you know that there was uh, investigation by the Tanzanian police. Indeed, uh, Gretchen and I first learned of what was happening when she came to, well, she had learned and came to my office because she had uh, 
been tutoring the son of a Kenyan police officer, and this was still the time of the East African Union, who was down in Dar working with the East African Railways. And he had come home just before she was leaving her tutoring and began to ask her questions about Kennedy's assassination. And at the conclusion of that, he had said to her, uh, well, we now have ours here. And she had thought only about Tanzanian officials, but as soon as she mentioned that to me, sorry, I, I still find the emotion coming. Uh, Eduardo's name occurred to me. Uh, as we headed home, we saw both Prexy and Pamela Dos Santos on the street, and were, it was confirmed. Uh, we got to our house and found, uh, Janet, as you know, was in, in Europe, in Geneva, uh, found Chud and Nileti playing with our girls in, in our yard. They had been brought out to uh, Marcelino and pa uh, Dos Santos and Pam's house next door. Eduardo was over, uh, Eddie was over there getting uh, fire ready for a uh, barbecued evening meal. And it was in this context that we had to begin to try to sort out what had happened. Well, the Tanzanian police inv invited an Interpol. They traced the fragments of the bomb, found that uh, uh, some of them had come through Lorenzo Marx. Clearly, uh, Portuguese were involved. PDA was involved. But how the bomb arrived in the, the Frelimo office, it was in a package with a, uh, a po uh, postmark, an East German stamp, uh, uh, as if it had come from Berlin. But, uh, and if I, I'm correct, Janet, uh, it was a volume of Pushkin's poetry, which was. No, it was uh, oh, oh, okay. May I elaborate on that? Yes, please. Ye yes. Uh, I was. I'll try to be as brief and quick as possible. Eduardo was murdered on a Monday morning, February 3rd. I was with Eduardo on Sunday, just before that, and several things occurred. But let me just deal with the, with the question of, uh, of the assassination that was raised. I was with the investigating police, and I was the one, I claim no credit, it was one of these bumbling, accidental things, who found the volume of Plekhanov's collective works in French, out of which the pages had been cut. I was given the, the exploded volume, and I went through the books in the library and found the original volume, in which the, ex the pages had been cut and the plastic <coughs> explosion had been inserted. Um, it was volume four, Plekhanov's collective collected works, translated into French. Uh, and the bomb exploded. We went through this several times. The first theory was that there was a bomb under the chair because of the destruction to Eduardo's hands. Uh, and I was asked again and again, did he have any mannerisms in sitting down that would have damaged his hands without certain other parts of the body? And it's true, he did. Whenever he sat, he placed his hands first under him, sat down, and then took the hands out. But this was different. This was an explosion that took place when he opened that book. Now, the Interpol report said that there was no doubt, and let me say this without naming any names, there was no doubt that the assassination, the trigger for the bomb, the uh, thing that exploded it and the batteries were manufactured apparently in Japan, shipped to uh, Portugal, uh, sent down to Beira, and that there was no doubt that this was Portuguese PDA with a certain number of extreme dissidents within Frelimo who collaborated in the assassination, uh, without naming names. I, I'm in no position to say, and I think there were several articles after that by Martin, who, uh, David, David yeah, Martin. who elaborated on that report. Uh, I think it's fairly well accepted by those who investigated that that basically was the pattern. Uh, who specifically and explicitly was involved is still open to question a great deal. Uh, 
May I add something to what, what Prexy said? Uh, the, I was with Eduardo on, on Sunday before the day of the murder, and I'd like to refer to two things as briefly as I can. One was Eduardo's love for America uh, when he was in Dar es Salaam was also expressed by a habit which he had of going to the Kilimanjaro Hotel on a Sunday and seeing the football, the, the movie reels of the football games. Uh, now, I was supposed to go with him. In fact, I was supposed to go with Eddie and Eduardo and have dinner that day and watch the football uh, movies and then come back. Early on Sunday, uh, Eduardo returned from a meeting which he had had at Silver Sands on the beach and said, I won't be able to go. Why don't you take Eddie to dinner? And I did. Uh, after dinner, I was invited back to Eduardo's house, and there was a round table at that house, a meeting of people at which Eduardo was putting forth his feelings and thoughts about black power as a movement and why it was so dangerous to have a movement based on race without a program, without a vision, without a plan of action. Uh, that it was not a black society that Frelimo was interested in building, but a non-racial society. And to me, it was very interesting because having met with, under other circumstances, with Mandela in South Africa clandestinely, the idea that South Africa was building a non-racial society, not even a multiracial society, but a non-racial society, uh, just fused so beautifully with Eduardo's whole approach to this thing. And that night, Sunday night, there was this tremendous discussion. Uh, the next day, the next morning at the assassination, I was at the university and a Fer uh, member of Frelimo, whom I did not know, a Frelimo guard, came and got me and said something had happened to Eduardo and uh, raced me to where he was. And that's where I saw Ed at the Dos Santos house. And uh, I, I knew what had happened. Uh, okay. I, I had this book you know, mentioned very quickly. You, mentioned it. you know, you should put into that, too, the funeral, because I, I think Ed can bear this up. We talked about Eduardo as the reconciler, Eduardo as the the person who could walk through, as it were, the, George mentioned the Cold War and bring China, United States, and the Soviet Union together in the support. At Eduardo's funeral, there was a mass of people, and there was a crush in the cemetery, and I was pushed in that crush. In fact, Prexy and I were partially together part of the time because we did a, uh, uh, a tape recording of the funeral ceremony. But I was pushed in this crush, and I was driven up into a small group of people at the site of where the grave was being opened. And uh, who was in that group of people? There was the ambassador from China, the ambassador from the Soviet Union, pushed together face to face. And who, <laughs> and who was with him? And Herb Shore was behind them. <laughs> who was with him? Tom Pickering from the American <laughs> Embassy. And they, they were all crushed together, forced to face each other at Eduardo's funeral. And I thought that was symbolic of the legacy that Eduardo had left us. Uh, Frexy. I want to quickly mention the last two times I saw Eduardo before that Monday. One was on the Thursday evening. We had a young couple on their way out to Natal to work for the United Church Board for World Ministries in our churches in South Africa. Uh, they had been rooted through, through Dar to get further briefing, and, and Eduardo graciously had uh, Gretchen and myself and the couple out to the house. <coughs> One of the questions they asked that night is, uh, was about, wasn't he afraid of being assassinated? And his response was so forthright. He says, you know, I'm not totally foolhardy. I don't always take the same route I, when I take the children to school. Uh, and I take what I consider con uh, reasonable precautions. But I am not going to have my life changed by the fear of what might happen. 
And then the final time we saw him was also at Silver Sands that Sunday afternoon, and we were taking this couple around to show them some of the sights of Dar, wound up at Silver Sands, and, and there you two were uh, and with an lady and your father and uh, uh, Georges Rebelo and the present president of Mozambique playing in the Indian Ocean and playing on the sand, and your father with his uh, unfailing sense of humor had gotten a sign from someplace, and I wish I could remember what it was, but when invited us to go over to the hut and had to show us this sign because he found it so amusing. But it's that kind of, uh, with what Herb has said about what was happening the other parts of that day, I think illustrate the, the depth of this man and his ability to live life and uh, uh, live it to the full. George Hauser, and then we're going to rapidly move to another question. I would like to uh, add, I mentioned that plane ride from Cairo to Nairobi in October 1964 with Eduardo. We discussed a number of things. One of the things that he brought up was the threat and the possibility of assassination. And I said, well, what, what kind of security have you got? Well, there wasn't too much, but they had just hired, I think, two security people to be outside their home. Uh, and so certain, this was f almost five years before the assassination took place. I can't help but think, as we talk about this, I can remember where I was when Kennedy was shot. I remember when I, where I was when the murder of Lumumba, when uh, Amilcar Cabral of Guinea-Bissau, uh, when Tom Boya was shot. You know, there's been a, a long line, Sylvanus Olympio and others. And I can re remember I was not in Dar es Salaam. I was in New York and I had a telephone call. It was such a devastating moment. Yeah. Let me just mention, too, that there is a context, to correct me if I'm wrong, but there were a number of key Frelimo uh, people who had been killed just before yes. the assassination of Eduardo in February of 69. Uh, Mr. Rando also just brought to my attention something I was very struck by, and I wish I had the time to elaborate on. I've never seen this reference before, but there's a book apparently called The Assassination of Eduardo Monlan by John Stockwell. Mm. Copyright 1978, edition stock, reprinted with their permission, translation by Carl Van Meter. Copyright 1979. I am absolutely shocked to see this reference. I have actually talked with Stockwell once on this very subject, and he said to me he had no information. I never believed him, but this is the first time that I've ever seen any reference. Do you know any? Please, please. Uh, the librarian of Oberlin College, uh, excuse me, you may want to uh, respond to this. Let's get him, then I want to refer to this reference to the librarian here of Oberlin College to help follow up on this. I'm not clear on the significance of the reference to stop, but I think you meant to say something which what I, my, 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 uh, my own theory, personal theory, is that these assassinations in Southern Africa have always had, if not the explicit collaboration on a certain level of the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States, certainly any information forward to those people who had been targeted. I think we have a question. We have to move on. There in the back. Yes, if you'd stand up, sir, please. I want to shift the um, discussion. You gentlemen are very good friends of the late Mr. Mon Lane, and you have painted a picture of him as a veritable icon. So I want to know, um, did he have any chinks on the walls? <laughs> For example, um, in retrospect, were there limitations to his Thank you. 
dumb to us. Who want who wants to be the first on this? <laughs> Since I think I'm the only person who uh, talked about arguing with uh, Eduardo. <laughs> Chinks. My concern then was that um, he was really trying to um, react uh, to the United States uh, not supporting his movement. Um, our argument was based on his, what I thought was his being anti-American, frankly. Um, and I felt that, um, okay, uh, we were involved uh, in the Cold War. Um, okay, um, I had been very active along with <laughs> with George here, um, doing such things as putting Oliver Tambo on television <laughs> um, to talk about um, the situations in South Africa. Um, and I, I felt that uh, Eduardo um, was being anti-American. The second um, issue I had with Eduardo was uh, at that conference um, organized by AMSAC. Um, Could you say I, what AMSEC is? Or American Society of African Culture. That's a long story. <laughs> um, I had, I was at the hotel uh, having breakfast when Eduardo uh, came down. Um, Pope John Paul had s sent out an encyclical. Um, some of you might know the title of it. I was reading it and I said, Eduardo, look. Uh, he's making a point about human uh, unity and so on and so forth. Uh, why don't you, uh, you'll be talking later on, why don't you use it? He said, Elliot, don't believe that man. Uh, later on, <laughs> Eduardo used it. Um, so again, he, um, he could have uh, these periods uh, where he took a very, very hard line. Uh, the United States, of course, um, and the, the church. Now, no one here had talked about whether Eduardo was religious. In, in, no one has talked about uh, his religiosity. Uh, and I wonder about that, uh, whether he's one of those colonials <clears throat> brought up in the church but had a certain ability to distance himself or herself uh, from the church. Uh, George Hauser. I don't have too much to say on the negative side. but. Perhaps a chink was that Eduardo was too trusting. Now, Leo Milas has been mentioned. Uh, we haven't mentioned Kavandami. We haven't mentioned Gwenjeri. But I can remember, and you may not know who these men are, uh, they were persons who were involved with Frelimo and in the liberation movement. And I can remember when uh, Eduardo himself introduced me to Kavandami at one point. He had tremendous confidence in this man. I can remember when he introduced me to Gwenjeri. He urged me and the American Committee on Africa to bring the Reverend uh, Mateus, was it? Uh, Gwenjeri. Yes, to. Uh, to, uh, to bring him on a speaking tour in the United States because he was going to be a great asset to the movement. Now, uh, all of these men uh, became, you might say, enemies of Frelimo. Uh, whether somebody with a little less trusting, a little less maybe a naivete, because Eduardo was very trusting and he trusted these men. Milas was the one who uh, was put in charge of the Ferlimo office when Eduardo went back to Syracuse University between June and September of 1962 and uh, was responsible 
for getting uh, David Mabunda and uh, Gumani, Paulo Gumani, expelled from uh, Tanganyika. And uh, they then went to Cairo and reorganized one of the movements that had been critical in the formation of Ferlimo, Udinamo, Udinamo. Uh, Paulo Kumani later started Coremo. Uh, and I went through Cairo at a given point, and I remember going to the office of uh, Udinamo in uh, the center which the Egyptian government had set up for liberation movements and talking with a man, I think by the name of Malusa, uh, about why was Udinamo reconstituted after it had joined Ferlimo. And he said, well, it was a based on a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding was that Milas was uh, not a Mozambican, but he was, as Prexy mentioned, an African-American came coming from San Diego. Eduardo explained all this to me after the fact. But here it was a case in which, what was it? A naivete, a great trusting. Now, whether that's a fault or not, I am not sure. Because I believe that one needs to have a great trust in people uh, that he is working with. But at the same time, it led to some disasters. One can talk about Kavandami, maybe somebody else would like to do it, about Gwenjeri. Uh, these were people that Eduardo had great faith in. And they turned, they had other motives. And it was a, a great liability. So that's one kind of, uh, I don't know, chink, that's your word. Well, I have one more comment on this, and I incidentally invite other people who may want to add some input into this from the audience. One further comment, Herb Shore. Well, to, oh, sorry, to add to George's innocence, as it were, or lack of awareness, I think it starts with that, the ability to trust people. All, to start out with trust until proven otherwise. But I think Eduardo carried that, for me, a bit too far, because he also expressed to me a theory. You talk about living in a world of contradictions. A theory that when you begin to suspect, the unity of the movement is the most important thing. And when you begin to suspect a certain person, it's better to move that person close to you and have him close to you, working with you, uh, so that you maintain the unity of the movement at the same time. To me, this was a serious flaw. I, I not only in Kavadami, uh, but, uh, and Guanjeri and people like that, but Uriah Simango, mm. right next to him as his vice president. Uh, so that the, his, I think he overestimated his ability to control uh, those who had negative factors about them uh, who were working within the movement. And, and that, I think, certainly in the guerrilla action and warfare is a very dangerous thing. I would hope that those of you working on this issue uh, remember to situate it in the historical and political events taking place at that time. I mean, to analyze uh, this question of individual players without analyzing the institutional roles of some of those institutions involved in that period uh, with some of the many ambiguities and different agendas being played out. I would, for example, point to one, the African American Institute in that period that was representative of having a multitude of different agendas, and these being some of the contending things that any of the political activists at the time had to contend with. I want to take a public position uh, very different from that of uh, Ambassador Skinner. I, I feel that one of the things that I often wondered about, about Eduardo, because as a young man, I was never really in a position to, to begin to discuss these at that time. One of the things I often wondered about was the, was the ideological development. My, 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 my sense was that towards that last year or two, I remember being at the beach many times 
where we had discussion groups going on, and I kept hearing new thinking and new ideas coming up out of Eduardo, and new, a new perspective coming forward. And I think that that was always, for me, one of the greatest tragedies, that in a sense, we never really got to see, as has been the case with other incredible third world leadership ripped off, as uh, George indicated, the full political thought of these leaders really uh, blossom. Yes, sir, question. Very good. I, I also, <laughs> I also have one. I, Eduardo, I used to go all the time with Eduardo to all games, and one of the things Eduardo had was this just love of football that used to just drive me crazy, because he 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 invariably Eddie used to be there too, and Eddie would run off. You know, Eddie's a little kid then. So Eduardo would say to me, go get him, Prexy. Well, I wanted to watch the damn game, too. So I'd have to be chased around the Kilimanjaro. <laughs> Very seriously, hey, Janet, please, you were going to say something. Janet Monlani. Last, the last, fittingly enough, the last comment. I remember that I gave an interview to one of the books that I saw here written by the Pan Am Publications. And I was interviewed and I described Eduardo, well he was dead at that time, I described Eduardo as being very pragmatic. This brought the wrath of Frigino Party down on my head because being pragmatic is not at all being socialist or Marxist. Nothing Marxist. There was, there was at that time, and there was just after independence, a very strong socialist uh, element in the party, which which dominated the movement after Eduardo was assassinated. Um, Eduardo was really pragmatic. He was not an ideologue. Ideologue. He was not an ideologue. And as who has just said that, Crexy just said, it would have been very interesting to know where Eduardo would have gone in his thinking. Because he moved with the times. He moved with house situations and times and eras and things were moving around him. When I have to speak about Eduardo, I often say, you know that film, Dr. Zimbabwe? I was a film as a book. <coughs> I saw the film. And the leaders that took over from Eduardo after he was killed were like Lava's husband, that bearded revolutionary out in the streets. I don't know if you know the book very well. Yeah. Bearded revolutionary out in the streets. And Eduardo was sort of like Lava's lover. And trusting, but extraordinarily intelligent. And I think that a person that moves with the time and can feel the big things going on around you, that has to be a very intelligent person. And unfortunately, when Eduardo was killed, 
then, of course, we lost that view of history and of the future. But it was seen as very negative by many people in Freedom. Who then acted independence? Who was the um, oh, please. number of times here at the Mozambique Institute. And actually herself, and as again was mentioned, Janet was not in Maputo, uh, excuse me, Maputo, I'm already living in Maputo. In Dar es Salaam, the day my father was assassinated, she was away on one of the many, many trips that she, uh, that she uh, took uh, during the time, during the, many, the, the difficult years of the 1960s. So um, one of the, sorry, just to, 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 to sidestep slightly, we are in the, in the process of the family of, of forming the, the uh, Eduardo Chabon Montblanc Foundation, uh, which is essentially to continue the legacy of, of, of Montblanc's works, um, and amongst other things. And uh, one of the difficult things, the parallel to as always has been the case in her life, of, of driving the foundation, of working on a, a book of edited letters of Eduardo Montblanc, which actually the originals are in my house right now in London, uh, all 8,000 pages, uh, pages of, of it, plus uh, the biography of Eduardo Montblanc, in addition to her own bi autobiography, which keeps getting pushed back all the time. It's very important that I remind people that, well, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early days of the, the conceptualization of the Eduardo Montblanc Foundation, um, I and some other people, don't take the credit for this in a team effort, had to essentially uh, uh, kick my mother into grasping this very important factor, which helps her to reach back to some of the, uh, uh, some of the details that, that, that surrounded living in the 1950s and 60s with my father, and what happened and transpired in those days, because she was a very active player. And I'm uh, mm -hmm. in that spirit of, of uh, mentioning spouse. Uh, Janet is a person in her own right, as many of the other uh, companions are, and uh, hopefully in, in due course we're going to be able to build on that as well. Right, thank you very much. In, in closing, in closing, uh, being a, a, a grandson of an AME minister in the South, uh, I know how these old AME pastors did, Al, and they always closed out with some kind of comment, and let me seize that tradition and say to you all, I was with a young gangbanger on, on the west side just three nights ago. Young brother's about to go to prison for 20 years, and he's about 17 years of age. I do a lot of work with young brothers on the streets, and he said to me, he said, uh, you know, Nez, he said, I, I, I wish I had some it's like a fog out here. This, 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 this world like a fog, man. He said, I wish I had some signposts. I wish I had some signposts. And I kept sitting here all this morning saying, this has been a morning of beacons and signposts. I want to thank you all for providing all that. Thank you very much. Well done. Al McQueen. Mm.